in our community, we uh, unfortunately have get used to the fact that people leave us. But in the family of Christ, it's uh, never goodbye, but only till we meet again. So the different seasons of life bring new challenges and new beginnings. So certainly for Peter and Beth, uh, have to return to the United States to take care of Beth's father. And she had to switch her ticket to leave urgently because uh, her father is in critical condition in the hospital. So certainly uh, keep them in your prayers. Uh, I believe Peter is online and is trying to get Beth in the United States at 11 p.m. at night to join us. Um, but we love them, their family, their sons, Mason and Grant, and we want to keep this whole family in prayer. Uh, they have been a part of the here for almost 10 years, I think, and they've done all sorts of different ministry here. And we're really grateful for uh, the time that they have spent with us. So they will continue to be in our hearts and in our prayers. So uh, Peter and Beth, we love you and thank you for the times that we have had together, continue to pray for you. And uh, everyone here, I'm going to just ask those who know Pete and Beth uh, and want to just endorse this prayer, could you come up with me so they can see you online without us shifting? Yeah, just come on up here. Anyone who wants to just surround them in prayer, it's great. Come on up, come behind me so they can see you. Yeah, there's no qualification. If you just feel you want to pray for Pete and Beth, uh, just come up and join us. Yeah. So Pete and Beth and the boys, you can see this huge group up here. Uh, it is an expression of how important and special you have been to us and will continue to be. So we want to pray for you. Let's raise our hands towards them. And let's just pray. Living and loving God, we thank you that by your adoption, we are your children. And we have an eternal relationship with you and with one another. We thank you for the years that Peter and Beth and then Mason and our Grant have been a part of our fellowship. For all of the sacrifices, the contributions that they have made to the growth that we have seen ECF, to the family that ECF is. So we surround them with our love and our prayers. And in this season that is before them, we know that you go before them to prepare the way. We pray for Beth's father in hospital. May your healing hand be upon him. And in all of this change and travel, May you be in the midst of them. May they feel your presence and your peace, and may your joy be their strength. And we look forward to the time that we can embrace again and know that it is only till we meet again. So we commend this family to you in the name of the love, joy, and the strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, hey, Beth. Mason and Grant, we love you. God bless. Just to let you know that on your behalf, the leadership has also uh, made a gift to the family. So we thank you. And now we have this point in our worship where we worship the Lord with our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. If you are here with us for the first time, uh, don't feel any obligations, but by all means, join in in our thanksgiving with you. Let, to. Let us pray. Loving God, for, for whom all blessings flow, we give you thanks for your provision, your love for each one of us. So accept these, our tithes, gifts, and offerings. Bless them, multiply them, use them for the work of your kingdom for we bring them in jesus name amen
as we watch let all the world see all the mercy we receive from so, so as we watch let all this joy that fills our hearts bring a hunger and a hope to those who struggle so hard. As we praise the Lord and we thank you for the offering. And now uh, Sunday school may be dismissed. Let me greet you once again in the name and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ and say how glad I am that you have an all that for Sunday school. <laughs> Pray for me. I have this recurring nightmare that I say you you may leave and I open my eyes and there's nobody left here. Today we begin a new series. Here it is our practice to open the word to series. And we try to we have decided at this point that we would try to alternate the series between the Old Testament and the New Testament, so that we have a balance uh, across scripture. So we have just come through a series on the important events on Jesus in Jesus' life as he approached the cross. As you know, we have just uh, finished with the Holy Week, and last Sunday was Easter Sunday. So we we have finished with that series, and today we start on a new series in the book of Malachi. You will know that it is the last book in the Old Testament, if you're looking for it in the scripture. Now, I have taken this title for the series, Malachi's Message Today. Malachi's Message Today. How can it be for today? Because a lot of people look at Old Testament scripture, particularly the major and minor prophets, and see them as antiquated historical literature that was written millennia ago by prophets whose message have little application to us in the 21st century. The minor prophets, in particular, I believe, are actually treasure troves of practical truth, that it is particularly relevant even now in our day and age. To be honest, all of the messages within the Word of God are timeless messages, because the truth of God is timeless, and the truth of God always speaks to our human condition which is a sinful one, unfortunately. We will look at different aspects in this series of Malachi's message over the next eight weeks. But today we begin with looking at what Malachi says about God's love. What does Malachi say to us about God's love? Now, Malachi has much to say to the social, the political, and religious compromise of both his time and ours. But the message is contemporary. The message is equally convicting, even though it was first spoken over 2,500 years ago. So let us look at the first 
five verses of chapter one for our study today. Okay, oops, I've gone too far. I can't seem to go backwards. Yeah, okay, thank you. A prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. And just quickly, the word Malachi means messenger. Okay, messenger. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert battles. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked man, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, Great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. Join me in a word of prayer. Lord, your word and your proclamations are eternal. And they transform lives. This morning, we open our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and our lives to you. Speak your transforming word into each one of our lives as we open ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the date and the background of this book are pretty clear. As I said, it's the last book penned in the Old Testament or placed in the Old Testament. And it was written approximately 100 years after Cyrus decreed that Judah could return to the land in 538 BC. Remember, they were taken off into exile, and after their captivity, they returned. But this means that Malachi was the last of the post exile prophets. Judah has returned to the land, and they have begun to rebuild the temple. And even though they are still under the rule of Persia, they're back nevertheless, in the promised land, and they have been seeing God's provision and blessing again. But here we are, after their, a hundred years after their return, and we find Malachi prophesying or declaring this word from God. We need to understand the background of this book, because every time we look in scripture, context is very important. During this time, the people find themselves back in the land. Their Jewish faith has been reformed. And not so long ago, this reformation was what ha happened under the leadership of the prophets Nehemiah and Ezra. Right? But it wasn't long after that reformation that the people had backslid from God again. And we see this so often in the history of Israel. Right? They have some kind of uh, reformation in religious terms, and, and God moves amongst them. He brings out a mighty prophet. They see the hand of God. But after that, they seem to let their relationship with God deteriorate. And the, their religion becomes uh, just a practice of rituals and, and so forth, and it's no longer personal and vital. Uh, so I think when we look at it, it, it's happened in all of our lives. Can you identify with that? That our journey with Christ is, is, is not a straight line. It's certainly not on the mountaintop all the time, and it's probably more of a roller coaster, right? 
hopefully as we get to the end of our life or the end of our days, the, the highs and lows aren't so pronounced anymore. But remember when uh, we were teenagers and, and uh, new and excited in our day, it, it seemed like a really big uh, roller coaster ride. There are great moments of high, you go to church camp or school, Christian camp, and you're crying and you're so happy and you're public and you just want to share with everybody, even the bus conductor, you want to tell them about Christ. Uh, and then after that, just reading the scripture gets a bit mundane and then it gets a bit boring and other things distract us and we seem to be distant in our relationship of God. So what the people in Malachi's time experience is no different from what we go through in our own walk with the Lord. Uh, personally, I've come to see it like this change of the seasons. Yeah. We go through different seasons in our life. God is the God of the seasons. So there are times when it feels like winter and it's cold and lonely, and God seems to be a little more distant. But even in winter, God is create, preparing and creating new life that is under the snow that will come out uh, when it's the season of spring. So I think we can embrace the season. But in this point in their history, Israel had lost touch with God. Uh, and so Malachi's message or prophecy from God comes afresh to them. And it was simply this. Whatever changes in the world, whatever changes among you, my people, God never changes. That is the message. God never changes. Now, right now in your own journey, you may be living in a period or a season where you seem to be waiting on God and nothing significant may seem to be happening in your land. But here is the message that comes to you afresh. Whatever may be happening with you, it doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't matter because God never changes. And here we, we will see subsequently, but just pushing forward in chapter three and verse six, it, God says, I am the Lord and I change not. I am the Lord and I change not. Here's something I just realized in preparing this message. Do you know why God never changes? Do you know why God never changes? And the answer isn't as simply as because he's God. Here's a different angle to look at it. God is outside of time. The Greek is not bound by time. He's outside of time. That's why he has declared, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end at the same time. God is outside of time. And actually, time can only be defined by change. Think about that for a moment. Time can only be defined by change. The world we inhabit is a world of constant change. Yes, you can't leave anything. Um, I have, uh, I think I've told this story before, but someone gave me a pair of socks for my 21st birthday. And it was uh, Adidas brand of socks. And it had such a nice embossed logo. And this was so long ago, um, 1978. And this was really precious to me. And I didn't want to wear it. 
because it was such, such an expensive and nice pair of socks, so I kept it. And I kept looking at it and said, one day I will wear it. And you're all already sniggering because you know what happened. Well, it's my wife does. Uh, when I finally took it out, and I was somewhere about 40, <laughs> and decided, I think it's time for me to wear the socks now. But when I tried to put it on, it fell apart. But also the elasticity, the, the rubber inside had actually deteriorated. And I couldn't use it. So I actually never enjoyed that pair of socks because of change. Think about it more deeply. If nothing changes, time is irrelevant. What does time measure if nothing changes? It is irrelevant, right? The scientific term for the fact that things decay is entropy. E-N-T-R-O-P-Y. Don't mix it up with entropy. That's the study of human beings. Entropy. E-N-T-R-O-P-Y. They, they have observed that there is a principle. If things are left, they will decay. So you can have a, a car or a, where you do a, a car park, but if you leave it with sufficient time, it will become a scrapyard. Right? The cars do not improve. If you take a scrapyard, it becomes a bigger scrap line, it doesn't become a kappa. So there is a law of time, it only moves forward, and that forward motion is defined by decay or deterioration, as in the case of the socks, as in the case of my face. Ever so often, I walk past the mirror and go, boom, who's that? You get to this season where you stare yourself. That's, that's not too helpful. But because of this change or degradation, we have the necessity of time. Because time measures actually the decay or deterioration. So that is why when we are in God's presence, in the new heaven and new earth, there is no more time. We are limited now. We say, how can that be? What, what will I be doing? It, it will be a non-question. Because in the new heaven and new earth, entropy no longer exists. So things will not deteriorate anymore. And in that sense, we will be like God. We are eternal. And it, I'll just close off with all this uh, abstract thinking. But if nothing changes, time is actually eradicated by default. Yes. Nothing changes. So what is the need for time? There is, time doesn't define anything any longer. So I want us to grasp this concept of who God is, that he is immutable and he is outside of time and he's outside of time because he does not change. And that is his love. I think when you are courting your spouses or there's always, uh, maybe not for you, but for me, there's this niggling here. What happens if one day I wake up and I don't love my wife anymore? What happens? Fortunately, it hasn't happened yet. And I don't think it will save my lunch. But we can be sure that God is not 
fickle like we are. And this is the first thing that I really want you to come to grips with me. That it doesn't matter how long, God does not change. So, moving on, Charles Feinberg in his commentary on the minor, minor prophet said that the spirit of the people in Malachi's day developed later into the sects of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that we find in the New Testament. In our age, the Sadducees were what we would today call liberals. Yes, in the political arena, they would be the liberal party where they doubt the things of spiritual or supernatural nature. Uh, in Christ's day, certainly the Sadducees, uh, would, after his death and claim of resurrection, they doubted that. They doubted anything that was supernatural or spiritual. And this is where we will end up if we do not have a living relationship and a covenant with the living God. And there's no need to believe in anything spiritual. Everything becomes by scientific evidence. And if you can't prove it, then I can't believe in it. On the other extreme, from uh, the liberals, we have what? The conservatives. And they were the Pharisees in Jesus' time, where their cult was one of following the rules and regulation, tradition. We've got to maintain our practices and our tradition. And so the institution became the object of worship, no longer the God who was behind the institution. So that is something we have to guard very carefully even here in BCF. BCF is in itself is, is not important. But what is in the name? If, imagine if we as the leaders start to keep pushing, oh, you BCF, you must come in a uniform and have the, the initials on your chest and you must sign up for membership and, and you must tie it regularly. But if you don't come at least two times a month, you will no longer be welcome. What is all of that? We are now promoting an institution. And we know through history that whenever any denomination or church has tried to institutionalize itself, I think it's fallen short. Because ours is not a religion. I always say this. Ours is not a religion. It's a relationship. Amen? We are here because of a relationship. Our proclamation, our declaration, is that we can have a relationship with the one who lives and who is the creator of heaven and earth. Isn't that awesome? You go out and you hear the birds and you see the clouds and you feel the sunshine on you. The one who is behind all of this loves you oh if that doesn't raise the heartbeat and the blood pressure then you're dead we need to be excited and you see this message constantly in the scripture god wants us to be excited and passionate and energized about our relationship with him So we see now uh, what is the first sign of their spiritual bankruptcy with God. In verse 2, it says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? What God is saying is the first sign of backsliding is an insensitivity to his love for us. When we don't have hearts of thanksgiving, to put it another way. I've been a pastor for 40, over 40 years. 
And when I was traditional Methodist minister, parish master, after service, we have an altar. When people come up for prayer, they kneel, and the pastors uh, kneel with them, and they make their prayer requests. This is just an observation, not a criticism. But in all of the times I've knelt at the altar and listened to prayer requests, I would say the requests or the expressions of thanksgiving were sadly in the minority. And if we go by Jesus' own experience, 10 lepers, how many came back? That's what percentage is that? 10 percent. Uh, I would say that's a reasonable percentage in my experience. Maybe only 10 percent of the prayer expressions were expressions of thanks school. The other 90 percent, or okay, not all of the 90 percent, 60 percent of, of that was uh, make your request known to God. <laughs> so it's okay, pardon me, I'm a little biased here, but it's the shopping list. Right? Pray for this, pray for this, pray for this, pray for this. The 20% that not so pleasant at all the complaints. Why does God do this? Why has that happened? Why are things so terrible? Why has God not let my business succeed? Why has God given me such terrible children? Why has God given me such a terrible spouse? Talk to be on the other side of the altar and not say something you shouldn't. Like you had nothing to do with it. Why did God give you such a terrible spouse? One day you woke up in bed and <laughs> spouse. <laughs> Unwrap the Christmas gift and ah, I got this one. No, it didn't happen like that. I haven't had a single marriage where that happened. You had a part to play in it. God gave you terrible children. <clears throat> Is there a company? Oh, kid number one. Christmas, open kid number two. Oh, you had something to do with it. I think one of the important steps in our relationship with God is to take responsibility for our lives and not just to ascribe blame. Yes. And so this is, you can almost hear the frustration in God's voice when he responds to uh, the people of Malachi's parish, as it were. You question, I said, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and you say, how oh, have you loved me? Imagine you as parents, if your child, one day you hug them, and you say, yeah, I love you. And they push back and say, how oh, have you loved me? I have less pocket money than my friends. My friend has an iPhone. Uh, 13, is it 13 now? Don't know anyone here? Is it 13? I think that's the latest, right? Yeah. And, and I only have an iPhone 11. How have you loved me? I think it will break all of our hearts, right? But sometimes in our own uh, communication or communion with God, is that the pushback that we give him? And so we understand God's pain when he responds to the people. Now, the word love used here by Malachi, I loved you. In the Hebrew language, it is written in the perfect tense. Not present tense, not past tense, not future tense, but in the perfect tense. As I said, God doesn't change. So his love, the first one of the first aspect of his love I want you to take with you today is that his love is a consistent love. A consistent love. Whatever is going on, whatever is not going on in your life, God has the same love for you that he has always had. 
I remember my friend's daughter having broken something when I was at his home and she ran up to him and said, Daddy, I'm so sorry I broke this. Do you still love me? That's a manipulator there for anybody. Do you still love me? So I remember him graciously taking his daughter in his arms and said, Dear, when you do something like that, I love you with a little sad thought. When you are good and you do great things, I love you with a happy thought. But that doesn't really matter. The important thing is that I will always love you. Uh, I thought that was wisdom. Yes. And this is the message from God, that his love is not dependent upon our actions or our love. He loves us with a consistent love, which leads me to my second point of the aspects of his love. His love in the past to Israel was a consistent and unconditional love. And so he is saying to them, I have loved Jacob. My love has always been there. And, and this is a strange one. We don't have time to go into how God says, but I have hated Esau. But I think the point I want to bring out is that God's love is sovereign. It is not for us to say, why do you love this and not love that? Why did you choose Israel to be your people and, and not the Wagga Wagga tribe? He is God. He is sovereign. And I think this is an important thing for us to recognize. God's love and therefore his subsequent actions out of that love is sovereign. It is sovereign. And one of the things that we can really help ourselves with is to accept the sovereignty of God's love and not challenge or question it. Be sovereign. I don't know why a lot of things happen in this world. I don't understand the war and the brutality that is being perpetrated in Ukraine as I speak. But it's not for me to say, Lord, we do not love the people of Ukraine. I have no doubt that he does. I have no doubt that the helplessness and the anguish that I feel does not even appear on the scale of the pain and the anguish that God has to endure. As he watches the evil that men do. But I can only quietly bow before him and say, Lord, because of your consistent love, I accept your sovereignty. I will. Finally, we see in the Old Testament that his love for Israel is an everlasting love. Those of you who uh, are of English teacher DNA might say, what's the difference between consistent love and everlasting love? I think the consistency pertains to the fact that it is unchanging. There is nothing that can alter the measure of his love for us. I think everlasting has a slightly different flavor to it, if you like. That over the span of whatever time that we have until the new heaven and new earth, and even beyond that, when time is no more, is love will prevail. It is an eternal and everlasting love. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3, we 
Hear God say to the people who is prophet, I have loved you with an everlasting love. He also goes on to talk about how his love is like that of a mother for her child. And all of us guys who have children, you will know that instinct. You will recognize how powerful that maternal instinct is, right? I have, I, I, I'm a bit wary about this illustration, but I have long since accepted and reconciled that if the house were on fire and I was immobile, Lynn would save the girls. Here's the quick uh, redemption, and that's the way I would want it to be. That's the way it should be. God has placed that instinct within your mother's heart, right? Uh, and it is right. But I think we, we accept that uh, this is, God's love is also one that is uh, almost compulsive. The mother's love, the, the mother almost can't help but love her child. Yes, this is my observation in, in my own family. That love, that instinct is so strong that, it, 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 that that love is compelling. And that is the nature of God's love. And so we see that God can't help but love his creation. He can't help but love all of us. His love is even more than that which you and mothers feel from within your bosom. In Isaiah chapter 49, he says that he has engraved his people upon his own hands. Your names are inscribed upon my palms. What does that mean? That, that God has this tattoo of names? No. I, I think the significance is what we just experienced last week in, in Holy Week. His love, his expression of his love that he has engraved us on his palms. He has expressed his love in the sacrifice, in the suffering that he was prepared to endure. And he says, I have done this for you. Would I have done this for you and not loved you? That is the incredible measure of his love inscribed upon his love. So what is the step of renewal that Malachi gives these people? It is quite simple. Get touched again by the eternal, never changing love of God for you. And I pray somehow by the hand of the Holy Spirit, a little spark will fire up again in your heart. Don't let the accuser of the people of God whisper in your ear. You don't want to hear the words, you're really not that good. You have failed God in so many areas. Your response to that is, get behind the people, say to For you to respond afresh to this new message from Malachi. Be restored in your love for oh God. This message is at the end of the Old Testament and it is repeated again at the end of the New Testament in the book of Revelation. With the message to the churches, the seals are open. The message to the church in Ephesus, what is it? You have done all of these things, but you have lost your first love. And it's not an excuse to say, I'm so old now, because God hasn't changed. And he doesn't want our love to change. 
when I was preparing this message yesterday evening, I, I, I asked my wife, uh, I said, do you think I still have that first love? <laughs> That's where I was coming from. And, and I would say, I, I think so. My heart still skips a bit when I look at her. Every day, when I look at her, I know my pulse goes up. And I still don't to gaze upon her, except she goes by you staring. But I would say I'm still very much in love. And it's a wonderful thing, because we've known each other for 40 years now. Right? But I believe that when we allow ourselves to have a portion of this love that comes from God, our hearts will be fired up again. When we allow the Holy Spirit to indwell our lives, we will see this passion and this first love come back. So this is the encouragement to you. That the message in Malachi's time is still the same for us in our time. That we need to cherish the consistent, sovereign, and everlasting love of God. What are those three aspects, please repeat with me? Consistent, sovereign, and everlasting. Now, I'll close with this anecdote. It just happened to me uh, on Thursday. When we fail to understand God's declaration of his love, or we listen to a false declaration, we suffer unnecessarily. Five years ago, I began to have pain in my thumb, right here and here. I remember it's five years ago because I led a group to Israel. And one of the dear ladies, they said, Pastor, why are you always rubbing your thumbs? And I told her, I have this pain here. So she said, okay, when, when we are on the bus or we're at the airport, I'll sit next to you and I'll rub your thumb. I said, that's great, as long as your husband continues to sit with you. So she was so kind. She always come and bring her husband <laughs> and they sit next to me and then she would rub my thumb. I see you rubbing yours. Do you hurt there too? Yeah, okay. So it started with uh, pain here and here, right? Then three years ago, it, it seemed to hurt my wrist as well. I started to lose mobility in my wrist. So I went to the hospital, just up the road here, I shan't name it. I, I went to the hospital and the doctor did an x-ray. I still remember the moment the x-ray came up on the screen, he said, oh, you have osteoarthritis. Your bone has degenerated. And he pointed it out. You can say, this is where your bone has degenerated. And, well, there are several things we can do to ease the pain, but osteoarthritis is incurable. And then immediately my mind flashed to my mother, always rubbing her wrist and her fingers, and my auntie who couldn't cook because all her fingers were, were sort of knotted open. And I concluded, oh, it's in my family. It's genetic, I've inherited it. So I declared to my friends like uh, Ricky, I don't know, I mentioned the daily device about my arthritis. No, I haven't, okay. So I just uh, accepted it. I accepted it that this is arthritis, I declared to Ricky, whom I play golf with regularly. I don't know how long more I can play golf. I'll play golf until it cracks up, right? Um, I'll bind it up and then we'll see what happens. So he was so worried how long more we can play golf. But anyway, to cut to the chase, on Thursday, I went to another specialist in another hospital. Um, and I went in there, apprehensive, and in a, in a way, kind of indifferent. What can she do? She can only tell me it's gotten worse because that's the nature of osteoarthritis, right? Anyway, she pulls up the x-ray, she looks at it, and then she palpates my arm and my hand, and she's feeling it, and she says, you don't have arthritis. 
And I go, what? I've been living under this declaration for three years, right? And I've been living with this pain for five years. What do you mean I don't have arthritis? I said, what about that x-ray? What about all that stuff which the other doctor said was cheese and my bones crumbling? And she said, no, oh, this is just um, your golfer, half of the course. This is natural deterioration for a person your age, old man. No, she didn't say that, but I heard it that way. This is just deterioration for someone your age, old man. And I said, what? She says, look, I, I said, can I have an, an x-ray? Do we need a present x-ray? She says, if you want to spend your money, you can. But there's no need. I'm absolutely certain this is not arthritis because, and then she took my hand again and she pressed it down here. She says, if this is arthritis, all these spots here will be very pain, painful. Okay? And it won't just be limited here. It will be in your knuckles and it will be uh, down your fingers as well. Right? You have chronic tendonitis. Because you thought you had arthritis, you stopped using your hands and you tried to not aggravate it. I didn't even dare rub it too hard because I keep having visions of cheese falling apart. <laughs> you know, and one day you see stuff coming up, and okay, overly graphic. But I just left it. And she says, your tendon has actually shortened because you've limited all your work and movements. And that's all it is. And I said, what's the treatment? It is just rub your arm every day. That's all. Yes. It, it was like I'd been born again. <laughs> Think about it. I was living under this declaration that by the use of my hands, I was worried how long can I play the guitar? Can I hold up the saxophone? All of these instruments I love, I can't play anymore. What's going to happen? I've been living under this shadow, just trying to accept that this is my fate, right? Suddenly she says, no, that is not so. And what is the relevance to this message? The devil declares in the recesses of our minds that we're not good enough, that we disappoint God, that we disappoint people, and that we are sinful. And we will keep returning to our sin. And we live under this proclamation of doom. And a cloud hangs over us. And it robs us of the joy that God intended. But today, like this specialist message, I want it to come afresh to you. God's love does not change. He has chosen to love you. And his love will be there regardless of who you are and what you do. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that good news? You have been set free. And then when I the, came out of the doctor's office, the one buzz that was rattling in my head was, and you shall know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Uh, and I still haven't gotten over the, the, the shock because I've been living under this hall for five years. Uh, five years ago, I just feared in my heart that it was arthritis or something that was uh, just, you know, I, I couldn't change. And that's why I held off going to the doctor for two years. And when I finally went three years ago, he confirmed it in my mind. And I've been living under that hole because I had heard uh, an incorrect declaration. So today I want us to wipe away the declaration and the accusations of the devil and come afresh to the revelation of the truth of God, that his love for us is eternal and unchanging. Amen? So go in the joy, the love, and the passion of us. Let us pray. Loving God, we are so grateful that your word is a living and a relevant word to each one.
we bind, we rebuke the false declarations that have been pronounced upon us. All of those declarations that have robbed us of our joy and our passion and our innocence, we rebuke them, we bind them, and we cast them away in Jesus' name. Lord, let your word today from the message of Malachi make a new, renewed proclamation upon each of us. Speak over us this, these words of your consistent, sovereign, and eternal love. Place this word deep within our heart so that it might bear fruit in our spirit. That even as we leave the sanctuary, the sun will be a little brighter, the air a little fresher, and our walk a little lighter because we have accepted that you delight in us regardless. Thank you for this wonderful revelation of your matchless love. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you rise for the benediction, please? Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Son, and the joy, the peace of the Holy Spirit be upon you as you go forth to renew your first love with the living God. Amen. You may be seated. Our service is over. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you again next week. Have a great week. I hope it's a week with more smiles and a lighter heart. God bless you all. Thank you.